Hey, I'm Alex Heim. If you guys want to follow along, check out what I'm up to. You can check out Modern Health Monk on YouTube or my book, Master the Day, on Amazon. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, it's not too often you get to talk to somebody who's not only made a difference in your life, but literally in the lives of millions of people. And that's uh, none of them, I guess, today, Alex Hain, who's uh, joining us all the way from, I believe, the, the northern part of the country. We'll get into that in a second. But uh, Alex has uh, been a really good friend for no other reason that he's, uh, that he's just such a giving, generous individual and so gracious uh, and just a pleasure to, to get to know. And I've been watching him on YouTube and not knowing that I was only one uh, degree of separation removed from, from you, Alex. And I want to thank you because today's my birthday and you agreed to come on the podcast as a special birthday present to me, uh, which has two different uh, benefits. One is that it's going to remind me not to eat too much cake because... <laughs> <laughs> Your book, Master of the Day, has really uh, has really uh, changed my life. It's it's helped me to lose some weight. I dropped five pounds. I always say I dropped five pounds from my double chin to my <laughs> stomach. I dropped it all the way down to my stomach. Nice. Uh, you know, I also I you know now I'm within you know those last ten pounds that are so stubborn. Um, as soon as I get past the first forty seven pounds, then <laughs> I'll be in that ten pound zone. But when I get there, I'm going to look to you for advice because. Really, you've uh, you've written such a wonderful book or an audio book, and uh, I listened to it, and your voice is mellifluous and wonderful. Thank you for being on the show, Alex. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian, and happy birthday. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's really a, such a treat to have you as a as a guest, uh, as a birthday present to me, and and really reminded me as I was thinking about it, preparing it, finishing the book, thinking about hmm, you know, now that I've listened to to your book. Can I even have that birthday cake? And and the thing that that really speaks so loudly to me is is your book is really it's not a diet book. It's not a book about diet. It's a book about habits, mm. and those are some of the most powerful things I think that humankind has are, are habits. But so few of us can actually master them. So the first thing I want to do though before we get into the book, which is such a helpful book, it's got you know literally hundreds of, of five-star reviews on Amazon and elsewhere. I urge everybody to pick up a copy. And, um, uh, and when you do, you'll be you know, transformed for the good. But I want to start off because you do so many different things. First of all, you're a doctor now. You're a doctor of uh, Chinese medicine. And we want to get into that and how that's influenced your life. But you do all these things. Now you're uh, practicing uh, as a health professional. You will be soon, except in the state of California. We don't have to get into that <laughs> uh, someday. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you, you do so many things. You're a famous podcaster, an author. Um, now you're a doctor. What do you think about, how do you characterize yourself? Who are you? What excites you most? Yeah, good question. I think for me, I am really always have been interested in kind of human potential. So the people I idolized when I was young, especially my early teens, I had a natural kind of draw to people that had attained mastery. And a lot of those people were... Uh, in the spiritual domain or in the religious domain, like the archetypal monk or mystic, the hermit living in the woods was something I really idolized a lot. But as I got older, like, you know, with all these career incarnations, uh, there are also personal incarnations, you know, that are changing and iterating. And I think for me, it's just at every phase of life, uh, there's something else that's really drawing me and really speaking to me heavily. And it's really just trying to see, you know, as I shed those layers of what I think is possible, what would that next thing kind of be? So I think I'm just here trying to figure out, you know, if my life is a story and everyone's life is a story, what does that really look like? What is the, what is the through line of that? And I think it's uh, just progression. So it's the nonstop kind of, uh, not, not necessarily that every single day has to be a goal. In fact, you talk about the, the, the problem with goals in the book. Maybe we'll get in there. What's the problem with having goals? You know, I got to lose 20 pounds because Alex is coming on my podcast. I don't want to look like a fat schlub. Uh, it motivated me. Uh, what's wrong with that? Well, I think, you know, I talk about this idea called wedding day syndrome, which is that everybody spends their whole life planning for the wedding day. You know, that's where all the photography and all the money is and all of the, the energy is. But then no one really plans for the wedding, which is maybe less flashy. And maybe what you should have done is read 50 relationship books and try to know myself and try to know the character of the person you're dating. So goals are in the same vein. It's we try to reach this end point. And what most often happens is we end up hating every day, hoping to feel well one day. 
And that one day is not even guaranteed, right? It's not guaranteed a person will lose 20 pounds. It's not guaranteed you'll ever be the YouTuber you want. It's not guaranteed you'll ever get your PhD. It, none of that's guaranteed. And so you're really, it's a bet, you know, can I put off liking my life to hopefully one day get what I want? And you only hear about the success stories. There's that, what is it, the survivor or survivorship bias? I'm not yeah. sure of the term, mm -hmm. but in entrepreneurship, it's one of the worst, right? Look, I did it. You can too. Well, maybe not. So that's, that's the big thing is how can you enjoy your daily life, but also reach the end point you want? Yeah, I look at you as not only a strategist and the strategist focused on that long-term goal, even though it's not, it shouldn't be the only goal as you're pointing out. Yeah, the wedding, you know, I've been blissfully married, although my wife might disagree, but you know, 12 <laughs> years now, we've got a bunch of kids. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. You're going to be in that destination, you know, maybe for one day in some yeah. case, but then the the long-time journey, which should be a, a pleasant one, whether that's with your kids, whether that's with your coworkers, that's the daily work that you're putting in. So right. I agree with you, the goal orientation, but yet you're unique because you have this ability, this diversive ability to be both a strategist on the long-term goal, but a tactician on the short-term goals. Sure. And can you lay out this, this sort of structure that you use in the book? You don't, it's not a diet book. You have one or two pages or one or two, you know, minutes about, you know, specific diet suggestions, but that's not the core essence of the book. The core essence of the book, as I see it, correct me if I'm wrong, is these daily tactics. And can you say something about how do you balance the long-term strategic goal with the short-term daily habits balance? How do you strike such a, such a remarkable balance? I think everything is kind of, you know, like in the book, I talk about half of it is the inner narrative, the story. And I think of that as like the religion. That's the 10,000 foot view. That's the overall direction that guides your life and the overall principle. And then specifically speaking, that clouds or religion has to be something about, it has to influence how we change our daily actions. So something about the daily action has to change. And for me, any goal I go after, I try to always, whether it's on a piece of paper or in a notebook, I try to always remind myself of both regularly. So every day I'm like, this is what I want or why I want it. And then tactically, what is one thing I can change about every day to make sure that, you know, I'm in the dirt. Like Gary Vee calls it, I think he calls it clouds and dirt, which I thought is a pretty uh, useful metaphor, which is you need to have the philosophy or the direction. And then also what has to change every single day. So for me, that's the way I balance two things because like I could say, I want to be a successful entrepreneur. Like, cool, who doesn't? But what's the religion or the emotion or the story that's going to drive that to make that happen? And then what does that specifically look like? I try to always do both of those. Yeah, and it's uh, it's unique and remarkable in the book. You give you know strategic uh, tools to you know to to come up with the ultimate goal, but you say it could be a long game, and we'll get into that one percent philosophy, which is uh, so interesting, unique, and provocative. But also the daily things, reminders, post-it notes, you know, something as simple as a, you know, 10, 10 cent or you know one cent piece of paper can yeah. make the difference uh, over the course of a year. Uh, of you know 10 pounds 20 pounds it can really affect you in a positive way right. uh, and on your youtube channel you have um you have this striking ability to create these actionable tactics as i call it. but they're not hacks i really don't think you can consider it a hack i think of you know gary v and maybe we'll just get into it because i look at people like gary v and and other people i had you know the, the musician rapper zuby on my uh, podcast not too long ago um and 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 i've had other people dr judd brewer who's a addiction psychiatrist at brown university and we will put links to all those in the show but you know a lot of it is kind of predicated i feel like weight watchers would go out of business if everybody actually followed the advice the first time it's like okay we did the you know we lost the yeah. weight okay but it, it's like these things but they stay in business and they're quite profitable because of, uh, right. for lack of a better word, recidivism. So, you know, what is the, what is the difference between kind of these, you know, many, many people who will get the get rich quick or get, get fit slow, you know, quick uh, roles and what you are purveying with, with your, with your book and with your podcast? I think the big thing is what we're really talking about is psychology. So understanding deep psychology about why people behave, they the way they behave is really the most important because just the very fundamental premise, everyone's experienced someone doing something different than what they say. 
right? If you've ever dated somebody, you also know that sometimes like, you know, maybe a person on the nicer side of the spectrum may say yes, but they may no. And that's very confusing if you just take it at face value. So obviously understanding what people do influences or is a reflection of psychology. Mm -hmm. For me, I try my best to understand why psychologically, why am I really doing the things that I do? Or why is a person really doing the things that they do? And when you ask people the right kind of questions, like what you kind of peel back is that a lot of it is just um, self-soothing. So there's a rough day, a stressful day, the person comes home, do they really want to exercise? Maybe intellectually, but what they're actually trying to do is they want to feel better right now. And so I think the big difference is trying to find the short term, uh, whatever makes you feel better in the short term, but also understanding your own psychology, which is usually through your actions. And I come across from reading the book and from watching um, from watching your your wonderful YouTube channel, uh, which is called Modern Health Monk. We'll put a link to that. Um, not that you need, you know, my dozens of subscribers. No, hopefully my my <laughs> subscribers are rabid. They're brilliant. That's, and that's what's most important. Depth they're handsome with. and fit. So yeah. <laughs> depth over width. <laughs> Beautiful, exactly. Uh, so you have uh, these actionable things. So they're actually takeaways. And it seems to me, I just did, you know, kind of a Google trend search on your own website. On your on your channel, and it's the most common things that come up, sort of in the word word cloud, are things like uh, journaling, meditation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you only had one uh, t- a, a tool in your tool bag, which would it be of all the ones that you purvey? Uh, for what outcome? For having you know, just m- uh, m- uh, optimizing happiness. I think that's that's mm-hmm. the key that I take away from your videos. I would say it probably would be journaling, but not in a traditional sense of just journaling about feelings, but mm-hmm. a reflect, self-reflective, mm-hmm. uh, self-knowledge type of journaling. Because I find that the deeper and the more complex a thing, the more essential it is to be written down because it's easy to just turn it into a mind game. And are those things that can help also with other types of, of issues that aren't as tangible? You know, for example, losing weight, there's a, there's a tangible outcome. There's a metric that you can, I find sometimes the hardest things to deal with are things that don't have metrics like fear, anxiety. Do you yeah. think journaling also is applicable in that to those particular types of proclivities? I think especially that it's especially useful because like you take fear, for example, you know, I've coached hundreds of people one-on-one and the main thing I see that the reason they don't go after from weight loss to business to writing a book they've always wanted to write is some kind of fear. Mm -hmm. But they may not have articulated that it's actually fear. But when they speak, there's what they're saying is I'm afraid of. And I found that if you take that person, you just have them write down what exactly it is they're thinking, then they can actually realize psychologically, it's actually that I'm afraid. And it's actually that I'm, I'm worried about what my friends will think if I write this book. And then they're judging me for, you know, who are you like to be writing a book? But I think also, if it is something even more intangible, like finding your life purpose, for a long time, I coached 20 somethings, and they would always say the exact same thing, which was, you know, I have all these ideas. And then in a coaching session, I would say, okay, write down every single idea that you have. I want you to write down every idea. And they'd say, I want to be an au pair and go to Spain. I want to go backpack around the world. I want to try being a blogger. I want to try going to get my PhD in physics. I want to try medical school. And when we wrote down all their ideas, it turned out to be less than 10, almost always. Mm. And by having that abstract, like I have all these ideas, but making it concrete, it was less than they thought. So I think it's, there's a real psychological advantage to writing things down. Yeah, there's a famous scene from the movie Wall Street, the original one with Charlie Sheen and Michael Douglas um, back in the 80s, Greed is Good, Gordon Gecko. And uh, at one point, I think I think uh, Charlie Sheen saying to his girlfriend, you know, my dream, my life dream is to get in a motorcycle and ride across China. And I'm just trying to make enough money to do that. Now, you actually did that in Thailand or somewhere, right? You actually, and how much did that cost you? Was that like $20 million? You had to say, it's like 500 bucks, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I think most people have this barrier that they impose. It's limiting beliefs is one other language for it. You know, that, oh, I can't do it. It's too expensive. It's too hard. I, I'm not the type of person that loses weights, uh, yeah. lose weight. But, you know, you point out and, and remind me of another quote by uh, Derek Sievers, who's another kind of um, inspirational figure to me. And that is, um, you know, if inform- lack of information were the reason we'd all be, you know, if information was the key to success, we'd all be billionaires with six pack abs. 
And what I love about your book and your philosophy in general is um, you have a sort of serenity that's not just like you know, Gary V's Gary V's a little hyper and a little bit you know kind of just too uh, too catchphrase ish and and yeah. you know, kind of like hustle hustle. I feel that's like kind of like hustle porn and right. or, or even like failure porn. And and you're very candid with your with your uh, audience. I mean, I subscribe to your newsletter. We'll put links to that. And you talk about you know why you got into this, why you changed. You were an introvert. Um, maybe you're still a little bit of an introvert, but uh, you're using the tools as a superpower. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, to to overcome some of the limiting beliefs that you might have had before, whether it's relationships, whether it's if you could complete your doctorate, whether it's you could um, you know achieve the the many goals that you've already achieved at such a young age, it's incredibly impressive. But I think yeah, this kind of um, I think there is an obsession with like oh I'll get all the information and then I'll apply the information. It's not like getting your PhD, right? And right. even your PhD or even your doctorate, it's not about information, is it? Right. So um, what I want to turn to next is uh, kind of this fascinating um, aspect that I have, you know, uh, taken from you is that this 1% difference and that a 1%, you know, people think if you ask the average person out there, if you changed, improved one dimension, one axis of your life by 1% each day, how much would you have improved by the end of the year? And everyone will say 365%. But of course, it's it's closer to about 3,200% because of the magic of compounding. And I want to talk about the concept that you call habit interest. Can you explain that for the audience? Yeah. So again, coming back to what you were saying, most people fall into this perfectionism category, which is that this is going to be a great day to write my book that I've always wanted to write, right? This is going to be a great day to start building my business. But when you look at how they're really built, you know it's really unsexy and people don't like it because it means that you could, you could have started any time. You could have started 10 years ago, but all of the books that I had written, I just allocated the first hour of my day, seven days a week. And I had multiple books out self-published before I was 30. My own business is another good example. I've never worked 40 hours a week in my business. I've never, even, I don't think I've ever even worked 30 hours a week. It's been an average of three Are hours. Are you a professor a also? Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. we, we work three hours a week on average. Just <laughs> right. kidding. Just kidding, Gavin Newsom. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is that with or without tenure? <laughs> That's how oh, with. Oh, you with. better believe it's with. Yeah. Oh, man, man. But, you know, even like with my business, a good example. So many people would love to be an entrepreneur. I never in a million years thought I would be. I've never even worked... 30 hours a week in my business. And yet when I entered school, I just promised I would dedicate three hours per day. And then if I was too much, I would dedicate less. I entered school, this four-year doctoral program with 15,000 YouTube subscribers and a business that was making me like $2,000 per month. Four years later, I graduated with 315,000 YouTube subscribers and a six-figure business. And that I was, if I could have done that faster, I would have, but The point was that I just chose what was that kind of lead measure, the lead metric that I have to do every week or every day. And for me, it was publish two videos per week. That was it. And try to learn each week and try to improve or do something different. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't seem like that would lead to the results I got. And I would not have been able to predict that because for years I I wanted that, those goals. Mm -hmm. But it was the very decision to choose the little thing that you can do the most often without failing. And then you'll look back, whether it is three months, six months, or four years, and the growth is tremendous. And it's surprising. The growth is stealthy yeah. because on anything that's an exponential curve, so I'll put up a figure of this in the, in the uh, animations in the background for those of you watching on, on YouTube, uh, when you have compounded interest – for a long time, as Alex works out in the book, let's say you want to lose 10 pounds in a, in a year. Uh, that's stubborn last 10 pounds that I'm going to get to after I get to the first 47 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> when you get to, to do that, for you go through this wonderful exercise, like the first 30 days, you lose 0.6 of a pound. And that's, you know, barely noticeable. I mean, you can go and have literally, uh, you know, a can of beer or even a can of water, and that will completely obliterate the exact amount that you lost and even more. And then two or three months, three months later, a quarter of a year, you might have lost a pound. Again, that's something you could easily overlook. Then 180 days, six months, roughly throughout through the year, you've only lost two or three pounds. Uh, But then it's that last 
exponential half of the year, you lose the remaining, you know, seven pounds and then you're there. But if you had given up at any point before then, then you reset the, the, uh, the exponential growth curve. Cause that compound interest as Alex is, is promoting, which is absolutely correct. It's what Einstein called the greatest invention of the human mind, uh, which, which actually surprised Jim Simons, the world's smartest billionaire. He didn't know when I interviewed him that particular quote. So I'll have a link to that where he was kind of taken aback by it, but he actually agreed agreed with it. Uh, and it's really this miracle that uh, compounding anything good, conversely, anything bad can have. So I wanted to just, you know, congratulate you for pointing that, uh, that explanation out. And really just think about it. I wanted to give you an, uh, you know, one other way to visualize it. So similarly, if you take a chessboard, and you put one little drop of water in the first square, and then two drops of water in the second square, three drops of water in the third square, how many how many squares do you have to get to before you flood out an entire football stadium? It turns out you don't, you don't even get to the end of the chessboard if you keep doubling every square because something like two to the forty eighth power is this enormous you know compounded interest. Whereas you started in the very beginning just with a single drop, this is never going to fill up the room, even let alone a football stadium. But that is really the magic of it. And why do you think so many people give up when they're on that slow part of the growth curve? Is it just natural human frustration or we want results quickly. I think it's both that, but also we're indoctrinated into doing things we don't like. <laughs> I think that's really it. Like if, if I was like, I'm going to pay you a million dollars if for one year you find the most enjoyable form of exercise, you do it 20 minutes a day, people could probably do that for a million dollars. Like oh, yeah. they'd quit their jobs just to get, make sure they get those 20 minutes. So I think a lot of it is we've been trained to believe there's only one way to reach the end point, And there's not, there's a lot of ways. And the more enjoyable the, the way should be the choice. Um, so I think it's, there is that short term, you know, the beach seasons in four months got to get fit. But I think there's also just everyone does the same thing. Like they try to do the hardest, most difficult, over the top thing rather than figuring out what's the more enjoyable way to do it. And as you also point out in a recent email, uh, you point out that habits are even better than compound interest. You know, compound interest gives you more money, which is great. No one's going to turn down that. Uh, but uh, with habits, once you accomplish a habit, then you become the type of person who has good habits. Mm -hmm. And habit stacking can then take place where you can then apply it to writing your book or writing, you know, you lost weight. I didn't think I could lose weight. I didn't think I was a type of person that could lose weight. Uh, I didn't think I was the type of person that could write a book. And then these things become compound compounding. And I think that's really uh, quite a quite amazing thing to point out and inspirational to people. So I want to ask you, when you accomplish a goal, you've accomplished so much, you wrote many books before you turned 30. This book is a runaway bestseller. Um, and it's been influential, hundreds of reviews, which is almost about them talking about master of the day. Um, <clears throat> you have other books. Where do you go from here? Uh, you, you've really done so much at such a young age. Now I know you're just starting off in your, in your Chinese medicine uh, career. Uh, talk to, well, first of all, Alex, can we talk about that? What drew you to, you know, to that versus conventional Western medicine? Yeah. Well, when I was 22, I bought a one-way ticket to China thinking I'd become a monk and Kung Fu master and I'd come back with a, a, a sagely orientalist Hu Feng Chu trying to be an Asian, you know, this little white boy watched way too many Kung Fu movies. <laughs> the poser. Uh, so I stay for a year. I do learn to read, write, and speak Chinese. I study Kung Fu with a guy who is a, he's actually a Tai Chi practitioner who was a bodyguard for the Communist Party. And I ended up coming back because it was a good year and I ran out of cash and I was like, well, what do I really like? And I came back and as I was figuring out my 20s, I started building a business and I had always had lifelong GI problems, even though I was raised in a healthy family. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I went to college, I cooked every single day, uh, but I always had digestive problems and I was always super underweight. Um, mm -hmm. And I went through the conventional medical system. I went through a general practitioner, a dietitian, a GI specialist. Um, and I didn't get any results. And I was surprised by how aggressive some of the interventions were. You know, I was 22 or three. And the GI doctor talked to me for less than five minutes and said, let's get you a colonoscopy. So he was, he didn't really even know much about me. He was ready to put a robot up my butt, essentially. And I was like, if I was like, this is. Can we date I'm first? I mean, let's yeah, go on a exactly. date first. Yeah, exactly. Buy on. me a dinner, man. Like, come on. <laughs> He's, he's telling me like about his vacation to Aruba in the most saccharine way. And I was like, dude, your rapport building skills are so bad. But really, it wasn't his fault because it was a system he'd been trained in. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm a very systematic thinker. So I just saw him as a highly trained cog in the system. And that wasn't working very well for most chronic illnesses. So it was actually a Chinese herbalist that ended up getting me the best results I ever had in 29 years. And that led me to begin studying this a little bit more and realize that since I was a kid, this is a lot like what I'd always been reading about these kind of mystic physicians living in the woods that were hermits and you know, the hero of the saga falls off the cliff and is revived. Like I realized that I always wanted to study with that kind of person. And it was more of these people in the Chinese medicine field. And so from there, it was a series of years of seeing these uh, renowned Chinese medicine doctors that ended up resolving my GI problems. So for me, the big thing though, was I was looking for really that unified field theory of medicine. And I did not see that in conventional medicine. And that's why it seemed kind of so pedantic, where it was always changing based on research, because it seemed like the core threads were not that strong. But I saw that in Chinese medicine. And so that was like, it was like love at first sight. That was really like, this is my, my purpose, my dharma. Mm. So that really resonated with you almost uh, at the end. And it certainly resonates with me to find this universal theory of everything kind of unification of these ideas, because there yeah. are so many different ideas and so much conflicting information. It's so one thing right. if you have information, but you have also decision fatigue. You know, how do I decide if I should go with Alex or Zuby or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> yeah. And I think, uh, you know, some of the some of the things that are out there, I would wonder from your perspective, if, um, you know, if there is an analog, no pun intended, with all the digital apps that are useful in, uh, for example, I use this meditation app, which comes with a band called the Muse Band, uh, mm -hmm. messes up my hair, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but also, um, but also I use, you know, 10% um, Happier, and I use uh, this new one by my friend um, Rockwell Shaw called Mesmerize, which is like a visual meditation app uh, that's quite phenomenal. What would the Chinese kind of tradition, the Oriental medicine tradition, what does it have to say, if anything, about these? Or is it just like, uh, we've been here for 5,000 years, uh, t uh, talk to us when you're 1,000 years old? Do you mean in terms of like specifically the psycho-emotional stuff going yeah, on? or just like the or? use of technology in, in the Eastern practices. Is it, is it frowned upon? Is it seen as like just whatever Western are kind of um, uh, liability? Or how, what is the perspective uh, from Eastern philosophy on, in terms of using these apps and technology to gain mindfulness or, or develop habits? Well, I think in general, like you have Chinese medicine, which is its own medical philosophy, and you can, you could use an app to do some of the diagnostic stuff. I mean, like even with acupuncture, they use a lot of electroacupuncture. So a, mm -hmm. a low frequency that's just, you know, kind of mimic stimulation. But I think in general, it would be interesting to see where Chinese medicine meets technology. One of my mentors is a cancer specialist in Portland. And a, I think it was a Chinese pharmaceutical company gifted him a thermography machine. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating is, when you look at uh, cancer and when you look at a lot of illnesses in Chinese medicine, a lot is due to circulation. I mean, our top two killers, uh, heart disease, obviously cardiovascular related. Cancer has a large cardiovascular component. And what's interesting is that a lot of the formulas we use are trying to reintroduce circulation to these areas that have been impaired for a while. So these byproducts get accumulated. And he showed us some uh, thermography scans of cancer patients. And you could see just the areas of heat versus cold like in breast cancer, you could see uh, just the dark blue areas and areas around the nipple or on the breast and in prostate cancer, or colon cancer, really, really interesting to see what's, what part of the body is really hot and what part of the body is really cold. So maybe something like that in the future. Um, but on the consumer end, I don't know too much yet. I know there are definitely like uh, wristbands for nausea, like pregnant women that are stimulating acupuncture points, the median nerve. Um, but it's a, it's an open field for that. Yeah, for sure. you might be the ideal person with your you know kind of tech savviness and your you know uh, unrivaled familiarity going into this uh, the study and practice. I want to um, uh, sort of come come to a close by asking some some questions that I ask a lot of people. But um, mm -hmm. but I guess I guess before we even do that, um, you know the last the last thing I want to ask about is is you know pertinent to things that you can have direct control over like sitting down and writing, you can actually write 1% more than you did yesterday. Or, or, you know, I have an Apple Watch or a Fitbit 
and I can say, well, yesterday I burned 700 calories, you know, tomorrow I want to burn 707. You know, so that literally you can quantitatively do that. What yep. about with things like, um, you know, after the book is out or your YouTube channel, as you said, I mean, you've grown it, you know, 60 X or, you know, or something like that in just a few years, that's not something directly under your control. Mm -hmm. You said you made two videos a week, but you know, were they all the same quality? Were you also improving them 1% per week? Uh, right. You know, how, how do you look at it in terms of things that you don't have control over, such as, you know, subscribers and, and critic and um, commercial success? Yeah, there's a really good book. I think it's called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Okay. And what it really talks about is how we don't really have a huge amount of control over many different outcomes. So what we have to do for something like, let's say it is audience growth, or it is something like, uh, f how about finding a partner that someone wants to date? How do you really control that? What are the metrics that lead to an increased percentage of that? And uh, it's really about finding what is the closest thing to something that guaranteed will affect the outcome. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, like if you're a farmer, you can't control the weather, but what you can control is the kind of crops you plant and maybe the fertilizer and the soil you plant it in. So you, you optimize for what you can control. Creating content, I can control the frequency and the quality. That's a very kind of amorphous, non-tangible thing. But I know if I just control the frequency, that's one metric that will guarantee affect something. Mm -hmm. And I can figure out what my system is for quality and then try to improve that. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's, it's trying to find whatever metric you think is the most related to the outcome. And that's not always easy to find. Yeah. Uh, so. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. So I'll put the link to that book. Yeah. The four disciplines of execution. Uh, I'll put a link to that in Amazon. Uh, so we can find that. Um, Great. So what I want to do now is kind of take you on a journey that I ask uh, my guests that I'm blessed to have on my on my show. And it really involves kind of looking back, looking forward uh, in time and connect in some way or another, either to uh, religious or science fiction traditions. As you know, our podcast is called uh, <clears throat> is called into the impossible. And that's named after Sir Arthur C. Clarke's famous three laws, one of which is the only way that's uh, possible to discover what uh, the uh, <laughs> sorry I always mess up these three different <laughs> the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible and so I kind of want to ask uh, a first question you know going backwards in time what sorts of things did you think were impossible as a 20 year old you know usually I ask or it's 20 something or a 30 something but you're you're 30 something now so it's not like you're a 70 year old like I've asked you know uh, much older people than you uh, so what would you give your advice to your former self that um, to overcome maybe anxiety about what was to become your future? So something that perplexed me that makes yeah. perfect sense today. Yeah. I'm going to give you a cheeky answer. Okay. Women. All right. <laughs> Women. <laughs> I spent so much time being this nerdy dude, just trying to find a girlfriend. And I'll give you an example of how I changed my philosophy. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what do women like, right? That's the, that's the religion up here. Yeah. What do they like? But I realized I was asking the wrong question because the real question was, did I respect and admire myself, mm -hmm. right? What kind of person did I have to become to kind of attract, attract the kind of women and really the, the life that I wanted? And so honestly, that was one of those things that was stupefying to me. But in retrospect, it's about, you know, the more you, you invest into your own self-improvement, the more you focus on living a full life, the more that will not be a problem. Well, let me know if you figure out women uh, because you're in for a Nobel Rain. Prize at that point. <laughs> Rain check on that, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Harder than all of theoretical and experimental cosmology. Right. Um, next thing that's connected to Sir Arthur C. Clarke uh, takes us perhaps into the future, which is, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Have you ever seen that movie? Oh, maybe a long time ago. Yeah. Well, there are these scenes kind of iconic where these chimpanzees or primates or whatever, they discover this monolith, this black object object like this thing over here and they chuck it up into the air they chuck a bone up into the air they don't really understand what it is and then later on in the movie there's also the same exact monolith this huge black you know structure we don't really know what it is at first um and that is uh that's found on the surface of the moon 
And it's obvious that, you know, whoever put this there was not intending for primates to find it. They were intending for an, the advanced version of the primates in the long future to find it. And it's sort of a time capsule that lasted a billion years or, or so. We, we don't know exactly what, but it was put there for to be discovered at a certain time. So I'm wondering if you were making a time capsule. Um, and it was some material object or some knowledge, not wisdom, we'll get to that in a second, some fact, something, uh, something meaningful that you've discovered or that you'd want humanity to discover. Uh, what would you put on this you know, billion-year long-lasting USB drive? So there's a great physician in Chinese medicine called Sun Sun Miao. And a story about him is that he left some of these most famous Chinese medical formulas engraved on, I think, on his actual tombstones. And the reason was that so that the poor could have access to those formulas to heal themselves for the rest of their life, because those were formerly heavily guarded. And I think for me, you know, I've been working on this book, I'll show you here, that I highly pretentiously call the masterwork. And this book <laughs> is, if, yeah, exactly. If I, Exclusive. Had to dis- <laughs> right. if I had to distill the, you know, the single most important things that have made the difference, what would those be? And I think, you know, whether I give this to my kids, I don't know, or it's something else. But for me, these are all things that fall into that religion category. What are the fundamental principles that dictate the direction of life? Um, and it would probably be something along the lines of what we talk about, which is that everything is one part your philosophy and your religion that dictates how you act, but then also what you do and how you act. Mm. So I don't know. I Maybe I'd leave them this. We'll see. I'll see in 50 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, they'll be able to get... One of the great things about writing a book is that it's there for all time. As Carl Sagan said, a book is proof that humans can work magic because you'll have this book or I have a book you know, that I'm reading now that was written by Galileo in 1632. And I'm reading this, you know, modern printing of it, but it's, it's just phenomenal to think, you know, as Carl Sagan said, you have the voice of a long dead, you know, human being in your ear and, and yeah. they're communicating to you across the millennia in some cases, you know, I was thinking, and in that book, uh, this may or may not be interesting to, to folks, but in that book, he's really railing against Aristotle and how Aristotle thought the universe was centered on the earth and not the sun as we now know it to be, or, you know, later Galileo essentially contributed to our understanding of that. And the book's about it. It's called the dialogue. And I was thinking about it. Well, you know, Gal- Aristotle lived, you know, in the s- a couple centuries BC, and here's Galileo. So literally, he must have been reading some translation of it into Italian or Latin from the ancient Greek, and it was like 1700 years old or more maybe something like a 2000 years old. And then he's criticizing this great, you know, mind Aristotle. Uh, and then now I'm reading it, criticizing Galileo, criticizing right. Aristotle. It's just amazing. So it's a phenomenal accomplishment. You have worked magic. I, I changed also my slogan to a podcast is proof that humans can work magic, stealing <laughs> that from Carl Sagan. Uh, uh, and I really want to thank you for all the things that you do. We're going to have links to all your, all your materials and, and where people can find you online. Uh, but but, um, but I really want to thank you for the service you've done for me personally and for our, our audience and just being uh, such a gracious, uh, humane, uh, sophisticated person that is obviously a deep thinker. And I wish you so much uh, blessing on your journey. I know you're on a mission to do good in this universe. And I want to thank you for sharing a little bit of that time that's so precious with our audience today, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Happy to help in any way. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible, please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at ImagineUCSD. Watch us on YouTube. Listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. Patrick Coleman, Associate Director. Produced by Stuart Valco.